Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, it's uh, my distinct pleasure to uh, have um, uh, with us uh, and uh, be able to introduce Dr. Uh, Joseph Maciero from Caltech. Uh, Dr. Maciero uh, obtained his uh, uh, bachelor's degree from, from, uh, in astronomy from Penn State and uh, his uh, PhD uh, from the University of Hawaii. Uh, then he moved to uh, JPL uh, where uh, he uh, stayed uh, for quite a while, uh, working on uh, um, mainly NeoWise, uh, the NeoWise mission, uh, of which he's actually the deputy uh, PI. And recently he moved to IPAC, uh, uh, but staying uh, in, in uh, the Caltech family. Uh, the, uh, the research uh, interests of uh, Dr. Maziero uh, revolve around the uh, uh, small bodies of the solar system, uh, in particular, uh, particularly the asteroids. Uh, and he, uh, he studies them uh, with the space missions in all uh, different modes, uh, uh, photometry, polarimetry, spectroscopy, uh, and he even has, uh, as I understand, a, an asteroid named after him. So today he will uh, uh, tell us, mostly he will concentrate on the polarimetry uh, aspect of uh, his work, uh, which is also close to our hearts. So uh, Joe, you have the floor. Great, thank you very much. And uh, you know, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Um, I'm happy to make this a discussion um, since I know you're all, uh, many of you are very interested in polarimetry. Um, it's real. It's a pleasure to be here and get to talk to you all about this, um, especially since the majority of my talks in the past decade or so have been all about NeoWise, and there's been a lot of great results out of that. But there's a special place in my heart for polarimetry. That was one of the main components of my thesis, and I built a polarimeter for the 2.2-meter uh, telescope on Mauna Kea. And then when I moved to JPL, I couldn't access it anymore, and so I didn't really get to do a lot of polarimetry work until this new instrument on Palomar came on. Um, and so I've been excited to get back at get back into it and to find out some really neat things about what happens to asteroid polarimetry when we look at it in the infrared. Um, and so I'm gonna present some early results that we're getting from that, like kind of the beginning of our survey. Uh, and we're looking to expand this and to look at more objects. Um, and I'll take you through a little bit about that and what we hope to do with this uh, new instrument. <clears throat> um, so uh, just before we go, this uh, image right here, this is what our data looks like coming off of the work pole camera on Palomar. And I just like to include it because it's such a weird image. It looks very different from all the other stuff that we see. And this is actually the, uh, an image of Ceres right here. This is the zeroth order and then each of the first order diffraction spectra um, for Ceres in the four uh, beams that I'll be talking about later. But it's just kind of a strange uh, data set. So I like it. It's, I think it's pretty. <laughs> um, but let's start with talking about asteroids and comets and what they are and you know, kind of a bit about why we care. Uh, so I love this picture. Emily Lakdawalla, who at the time was the Planetary Society, put this together. And this is a two-scale comparison of all of the asteroids, these minor planets, and the comets that we had visited um, <clears throat> with spacecraft at the time it was put together. Um, Ceres and Vesta are not included because they're way too big. But in addition to having the sizes be proportional, the albedos, the reflectivities are also proportional, and the colors too. And so you can see that, you know, asteroids in general are kind of these gray potato-y things, but they range from, you know, like a light gray to you know, kind of a sidewalk color down to this dark gray asphalt color, um, or maybe, you know, the comets here are all very dark. Um, and this is, you know, pointing at the differences in origins for these bodies, even though they all kind of hang out in the same region of our solar system. And the reason these small bodies are so interesting is that they're, they're time capsules from our planetary formation. These are things that are unchanged or effectively unchanged since the beginning of the solar system. They formed about where they are today, at least the ones in the main belt. Um, and they've kind of stayed there. And yes, of course, they've been exposed to the weathering from the solar wind. And there have been collisions, as is readily apparent from the craters that you can see on Lutetia here, and this giant crater on Matilda that's you know, a huge fraction of the diameter of the body. Um, so there absolutely has been processing, but not in the same way that we had on the terrestrial planets. Um, other than Vesta, most of these didn't melt. They never got hot enough to mineralogically change. And so if you can get pieces of these, or if you can understand 
what they're made of and how they're constructed and how the minerals that make them up were constructed, you're probing directly the protoplanetary disk conditions at the location these objects were. Now there's been shuffling too. I, we know that a lot of these comets formed closer to the sun than they are today, were pushed out in the early stages of planet formation when Jupiter was growing and have been then come back in, especially the long period comets that are in the Oort cloud were frozen you know, snapshots at that time and then come back in with these kind of very primitive volatiles. The asteroids, on the other hand, are kind of where they started. There might have been shuffling. You know, there's a theory of the Grand Tack that Jupiter moved around and brought a bunch of stuff from beyond where it formed inward and then moved back outward, clearing out the area, the region in the process. But in general, we think that these formed about in these locations. And so especially these lighter materials, um, probably are very similar to what built the Earth. And this darker material is probably very similar to the stuff that was impacting the surface of the Earth at the time of the late heavy bombardment. And so left the late veneer of organics, of volatiles, of water uh, that we see on the surface of the Earth today. And so that's a little bit of motivation of why we're so interested in studying these objects. Um, now, this is what we have seen with spacecraft. And there's been a few more added. Um, I don't, this is, this was made before uh, Ryugu and Bennu were visited by spacecraft. Both of those are a little bit smaller than each of the components of Braille here. Um, but so that's you know, a, a dozen or two dozen objects that we've really been able to investigate with spacecraft. Um, we know of, however, over a million of these objects. Uh, and this is a top-down plot of the solar system, the sun in the middle, each of these cyan lines is one of the planets. So this outer one here is Jupiter. And each of these dots is an object that's currently being tracked by their minor planet center. So, and this is its position at that time this plot was made. So we know of a million objects, but for the vast majority of these objects, all we know about them is their orbit and a rough guess of their brightness. And maybe for 100,000, 150,000, we have a size from Neowise and from uh, Spitzer and from Akari and from IRAS. And from those, we can get albedos. And so we have a basic reflectivity. Is it, you know, is it like chalk? Is it like coal? And then for a few thousand, we have spectra and other kinds of classification. So as you get to more detailed classification, you would take in a narrower and narrower slice of these objects. So we want to study the ones with spacecraft as well as possible. And we want to study the next set that we have a lot of data so that we can build this bridge from what we know in detail all the way to this broader population that we really could never visit with spacecraft completely. We're never gonna send a spacecraft to visit a million objects. We're never gonna get a true in-person census of these. So we have to learn what we can via remote sensing. Now, of course, the solar system didn't start out this way. Uh, back in the 1800s, uh, this is what the solar system looked like. And it was just the planets. Um, there were no minor planets known other than the occasional comet, which were you know, thought to be atmospheric phenomenon perhaps, or something unusual happening, but they were kind of left as question marks that showed up every century or so. And really, you know, maybe there were portents of doom. Um, and this was all well and good until about the late 1700s when Uranus was found. And when that happened, when William and Carolyn Herschel found Uranus, um, that opened up this new field of, hey, maybe there's more stuff out there than the things we've known about since antiquity. And that began the searches looking for new minor planets, especially in this awkward gap between Mars and Jupiter that a lot of the now debunked theories at the time said there should be a planet in this missing gap. And so searches were conducted and uh, shortly after 1800, an object was found. And this was Ceres and the problem was solved. It was the missing planet and then more were found. And so, okay, well, there's five missing planets in there. Uh, and then more were found 20 years later. And that's when the floodgates opened and more and more objects started pouring in as these surveys kept being conducted. And we went from having seven plants to eight plants in the solar system to I think around 30 plants at the most. And then they redefined what a planet was to make all of these objects minor planets or asteroids. And that was great. And these surveys continued. And as photographic plates got better, the numbers increased. And then when CCDs came online, you'll see a steep increase in the number of objects that we find in the late 90s. Uh, funding was increased for a variety of reasons, uh, not limited, you know, most importantly, uh, the movie Armageddon, uh, which spurred a public knowledge of hazardous asteroids. Uh, and so that brings us to today, where we know of these million objects. But as I said, not all of them can ever be studied with all of our analysis techniques. 
and we can't get the full detailed picture of all of them. So we need to take what pieces we can and try and categorize and bin the objects by location in the asteroid belt, by um, what, by for instance, reflectivity and size and orbital changes, and basically use all these multifaceted views to build up our, our observations of this population and interpretation of solar system formation. Uh, and so one of the ways we do that is with asteroid taxonomy. And so this is from Francesca DeMeo's 2009 uh, thesis paper, where she took uh, optical plus near infrared spectra of a large number of objects, a few objects, a few thousand asteroids, and did principal component analysis to basically set apart and draw lines between the various kinds of spectra that were observed. And so there's these rough bins of objects that had flat spectra that were either bluish or flattish or reddish up here, but otherwise somewhat boring spectra. Um, and then objects that in this area showed these absorption features, these very broad mineral bands that are associated with the olivines and the feldspar silicates. Um, and so uh, these spectra generally cover from around 0.4 microns out to 2.5 microns in each of these little uh, cartoons here uh, to give you an idea of kind of the spectral range we're talking about here and the variety of objects that we can see. And so some objects would have these deep one micron absorption features and nothing at two. And some objects, uh, the V-types here, these have later been linked to Vesta, um, show very deep one and two micron absorption features. Um, and so those are pointing directly to this mineral history, right? The, the thermal processes that they underwent. We know that Vesta melted. And we know that from the meteorites we have in the ground of it, that um, a lot of the metals drained away to a mostly solid core, very similar to the process that Earth underwent. And so that left a specific kind of silicate on the surface that the majority of the silicate rich objects we see don't, they look a little bit like it, but they're not, they didn't have that same history. Um, and so we see this gradient in band depth, we see this gradient in slope. Um, and again, all of these are uh, allowing a hinting at what is mineralogically happening on the surface. Now, what we can do is take these various spectra, these various taxonomic classes, the opaque rich or primitive objects, which we generally refer to sometimes as the C complex, these mafic rich silicates, so the silicate rich, the Vesta like, um, we refer to these as kind of the S complex. And then there's some other objects that, you know, other kinds of taxonomies. But if we just look at these two, the blues and the orange ones, um, we can take a look at what the fraction of them is with across the belt. So as we go out from the sun, so here we are showing semi-major axis as a function uh, in, in AU rather. Um, and this is log of mass. And so uh, this is something Francesca did in 2014 with her collaborators, basically doing a mass debiased version of the solar system. Um, and you can see, you know, Vesta and Ceres and Pallas and Hygieia are outliers here. They are very massive bodies. But if you look at the other objects, they show these broader distributions where you have, you know, kind of a 50-50 split of mass between this primitive complex and this silicate rich complex in the inner portions of the belt. Um, maybe a little more silicates here, but as you go through each of these Kirkwood gaps, these are the mean motion resonances of Jupiter that separate out the different subpopulations of the belt, <clears throat> we start to see a transition. We start to see the objects going from, you know, being dominated by these silicate rich objects in terms of mass to having kind of this 50-50 split. And then as you get further out and further away from the sun, the silicates start to vanish. Uh, and you start to see that the belt is almost entirely these very dark objects, these things that are rich in you know, opaque riches. And what that means is rich in carbon and carbon bearing minerals and hydrated silicates. And so while they may not have water in their present day surfaces, right? they're not active like comets, although objects like Femus do occasionally show activity, um, they're not they're not ice rich the way you would think of a comet is, but they clearly had ice during their formation, and they warmed up enough that that water blended in with the silicates to form serpentine is one of the most common uh, water rich silicates that we find on these, um, and so you know they were warm but wet muddy balls, but never really underwent the metamorphic processing we have on Earth, um, and may still have you know a lot of the metals that we see a lot of this nickel iron. Uh, flack, you know, just small veins of nickel iron running through the object from when it condensed that you will never get on, an, on a, you know, 
a rock from Earth because everything on Earth was at one point totally molten. Um, and so you can look at these, uh, the transition from water rich to metal poor as kind of a temperature and time gauge for the formation of these objects. Um, and so we can compare these spectral classifications uh, to the meteorites we have on the ground. One of my favorite parts of planetary science is the fact that we have hand samples of the astronomical objects that we're studying. Right? And we can try and do a one-to-one. -one. We can pick up this rock, this meteorite, and try and point it directly back to the object it came from, or the parent body, or the formation region in our solar system, and do this direct analogy. Um, and so if you, and so uh, this is, you know, Francesca has done a lot of work, obviously, in spectral classifications. Um, and so this is a work she just very recently released, where she did a statistical analysis of the spectra of all of these asteroids versus the spectra of a bunch of different classes of meteorites. And that's what's being shown at the bottom here is a variety of different meteorite classes. Um, and the specific classes aren't really important so much as the clustering you can see between the colors here. So, you know, these S-type objects tend to be representative of these three kinds of meteorite, the ordinary chondrites. And these, the ones that start with a C are the carbonaceous chondrites. And they are clearly drawing from a different population of the solar system, of the spectral taxonomies. And then you get some weird ones where you can see these, you know, kind of purplish ones floating here. The V types, these dark greens, the uh, Howardites, Eucrites, and Diogenites, these are the HED meteorites that for decades now have been known to be directly linked to Vesta. These are pieces that were knocked off in the giant collision that happened a billion years ago and have been coming to Earth ever since. Um, and so it's this kind of a relationship, the you know, Vesta to the HED meteorites um, that we are trying to replicate here for the broader classes. Um, and this is being supported by results like Hayabusa, bringing back samples of Itokawa, that show that these S-type objects are indeed linked to the ordinary contracts. And uh, Hayabusa 2 and Osiris-Rex, bringing back samples of Ryugu and Bennu, that are allowing us to link which kind of carbonaceous contract. Um, or, and one of the more interesting things is, maybe the surface material of places like Bennu and Ryugu are not represented in our meteorite population because they're very friable. They crush very easily, and so they don't survive atmospheric entry. A lot of our, you know, all of the meteorites that we have in hand had to have come through the atmosphere. And so there's a big filtering process there that they have undergone. So we also want to understand that. How does, you know, the things that were sturdy enough to survive are perhaps from a different place in an object than this surface material that we're able to observe astronomically. Because realistically, when we observe an object with a spectrum or with thermal infrared or with polarimetry, we're only really sampling the upper couple microns of the surface material. And so again, relating that to what's just below the surface to what's sturdy enough to survive an atmospheric entry is part of the fun and part of the ongoing work that we're working on here. So this is how, you know, these meteorites and these taxonomies relate to different things. Um, and so, you know, the thrust of my talk now is talking about polarimetry. And we find that, you know, polarimetry also has these direct relations with these taxonomic spectral classifications. And so this is work that Ricardo Gil Hutton and his students were doing back in 2011, 2012, and even up to the present day with the Castillo survey. Um, and they were taking observations of numerous different spectral classes of asteroid and then binning them together in, at optical wavelengths, at visible wavelengths rather, um, to look for the behavior of the polarization that we measure as a function of the phase angle. So this is the opening angle between the Earth and the sun as seen from the asteroid. And so an object at opposition would have a zero degree angle. And as you get to larger and larger separations between the Earth and the sun in the asteroid sky, this phase angle goes up. Um, and we see that while generally asteroids follow this trend of having a negative polarization that proceeds to positive after around 20 degrees, the depth here and the steepness of the slope change for the different classes of objects and are basically distinct fingerprints for each of these objects. And this is what lets us then directly relate what we're measuring polarimetrically with what is going on on the surface. And while, yes, these are correlated with spectra, um, 
it's possible, and I'll show later that it's, you know, we're, we're able to sense things that you can't get spectroscopically, and in fact, can get in no other way. Uh, so I have a question. Yeah. So what's, what's the meaning of the negative polarization fraction? I will get there in one second. Um, but yes, that's, that's a great question. Um, and it's a convention that is important for asteroid science. So let me do that. I think that's in two slides. Um, so let me go over basic polarimetry real quick for those of you who might not think it because it, it's a different kind of thinking, right? You, you have to start thinking about light both as photons and as waves, but the waves with the directionality. Um, and there's, there's information encoded in that. And that's what I really like about polarimetry is we're, we're getting a different piece of information from the same light that we don't get from spectroscopy or from photometry. And so in general, polarimetry, uh, linear polarimetry is either in you know, one of these orthogonal axes or rotated 45 degrees. These are kind of the two axes that we're trying to measure when we're looking at polarimetry of an astronomical object. Basically, are the light vectors oscillating up and down or left and right? Or are they oscillating plus, minus, plus 45 degrees or minus 45 degrees? Um, light can also follow what's called circular polarization. And this is where the peak of the electromagnetic wave actually does a, you know, a helix around the direction of propagation. And so it can either have a clockwise sense of rotation or a counterclockwise sense of rotation. Um, and that is what basically you're looking for circular polarimetry is which way the light is oscillating. Now for um, radio sources, we see circular polarization pretty often. Um, for scattering, uh, we haven't seen any conclusive cases of large uh, circular polarization coming out of these, coming out of things like asteroids. Um, I say large because there's some early work being done by Sloan Viktorowicz, who is uh, getting very small, he's doing part per million polarimetry, but is getting very small changes in the circular polarimetry. And we think that that is tracing directly back to mineral content in the, or, I'm sorry, metal content in the surface, because um, metals would be expected to induce a circular polarization as they reflect light in a way that simple scattering from silicates doesn't. Um, and so when light is scattered off of any surface, it will induce a linear polarization. And this is something you learn in basic physics, Brewster's angle, right? When you see light scattered off of a wet roadway, um, it's highly polarized. And that's why polarized sunglasses work so well as it cuts down on that glare because you can remove you know, 50% of the vectors is, you know, nearly 100% of the scattered light, while the background, you're only cutting down half the light. And so it's the same kind of sense of looking for scattered, scattering induced polarization that we're looking for on the asteroid surfaces. Um, however, it's not quite as simple as this wet roadway, right? That's a very simple surface with a very simple single scattering. And asteroid surfaces are more complex. There's regolith, there's multiple scatterings. And so we see unusual behavior that kind of wasn't expected until it was first observed on the moon and then later observed on asteroids. Um, and that was that you know, kind of weird shape where it goes negative and then positive um, over the course of you know, opening phase angles. And the reason for this uh, was postulated, Karen Yunonin came up with a very convincing explanation for this a couple decades ago. And the idea here was that you're actually getting constructive and destructive interference of light being scattered off the surface, depending, and in particular for things that are doubly scattered. So light, instead of hitting one scattering element and coming to the observer, if you, have, if you hit a single scattering element, go to a second one and come to the observer, you actually have these subtle differences that result in changes in the polarization. And so the way this is described is you can imagine if these two balls are your two ideal scattering elements on an asteroid surface, then if you're having, you know, light coming in from the sun is parallel and the, at the observer is far enough away from the asteroid that any light that's leaving is also considered parallel from all the various surface elements. And so if you have light coming in, for instance, a solid line hitting scatterer A, based on simple Brewster scattering, you would expect light to be preferentially polarized perpendicular to the scattering plane. And so 
you would expect as the light comes down and goes to element B, it would pick up some scattering in this you know, XY plane. And then when it scatters off of B and then goes to the observer, you would expect to see polarized light in this direction here. You know, so kind of in the, where, where the uh, small arrow is pointing. And so that would be the polarization you would expect to be induced by this light path. The complementary light path where you have light coming in, hitting B, going to A, and then going to the observer, you'll notice has effectively the exact same path length. And so regardless of what this alpha phase angle is, you get constructive interference in all cases. Um, now, this light that comes out of here, when you're talking about the overall scattering plane, the sun object Earth, this light appears to be polarized in that plane. And so again, this is opposite of what you would naively expect from single scattering, but you're getting constructive interference of this Naive, naively, you know, of this second order scattering light in this component here. The converse, if instead you have your elements oriented this way, when you go through this same exercise, what you'll find is that the path length is not the same. As this alpha changes, you'll see that this component of the one scattered vector is, becomes a little bit longer. And so you have this D sine alpha, where D is the distance between scattering elements, and alpha here is this phase angle. And so as phase angle changes and this distance between these elements change, which we assume to be some property internal to the mineral, these aren't you know, balls sitting on the surface that the light is scattering between. This is some sort of internal mineral, in, mineral double scattering. Um, so if this is fixed for the surface of the body, then as phase angle changes, this distance changes and you can go from constructive to destructive interference. Um, and so this is exactly what we see happening, right? And so again, in this situation here, you have your light coming in, it gets scattered. The single scattering is perpendicular to the plane. The single scattering is again perpendicular to the plane. And so the light coming out here is perpendicular to your Earth object sun plane. So follows what you expect it would be the simple single scattering law but it's that one that destructively interferes for some values of alpha. And so when you run all these numbers through for asteroidal-like bodies, <clears throat> um, you get that curve I showed before. Um, you know, let me go, I'll go to this in one second. So when you run those numbers through, you get this kind of curve here. And so for phase angles below around 20 degrees, you get the scattering in the plane, which we call positive polar, I'm sorry, scattering perpendicular to the plane. So this is the naive single scattering expectation. We define this as positive. And then nine, any polarization 90 degrees from that, we define that as negative, because this is what you would expect to have zero polars. You expect it not to be scattered in this plane, unless you have this strange destructive interference. And so what we see is for phase angles less than 20 degrees, you get that destructive interference. Um, and then as you get to phase angles larger than 20 degrees, the interference goes away and single scattering starts to take over. You become less likely to get double, sc double scattering of light from surface element to surface element and instead become more likely to get single scattering. Now, what's nice about this theory with this constructive and destructive interference is this also explains the photometric opposition effect. And so as you get to very small phase angles down below a couple degrees of phase, um, we, we have seen objects like asteroids, like TNOs, like the moon, steeply increase in brightness. And this is due to this constructive interference of the multiple different scatterings of light all coming back to the observer. Um, and so this ties in directly with the same theory of what's causing this negative branch of polarization here that then recovers to positive. Now, um, okay, so how do we measure the polarization? So if you have this light coming in, you can send it through, for instance, here, just an illustration of a wire grid polarizer, right? So this is basically just a fancy version of polarized sunglasses, and this will cut down half of the light. You'll lose any vector that's you know, going this way, and you'll only pass through any vector going this way. And so if in front of this, either, so you either can rotate this wire grid polarizer, or you can put in front of it a half wave plate. And so this is a material that has a different index of refraction 
for one axis versus the perpendicular axis. And so we'll slow down light in the orthogonal axis compared to the vertical axis. Um, and if you design the thickness of this right, you can slow it down by exactly half a wave. And this is what's being represented here. This is the, the uh, Mueller matrix for the Stokes vector. And so a Stokes vector is carrying, I here is the intensity of the light, Q is the vertical or negative Q, the horizontal polarization, U the plus or minus 45 degree polarization, and V is the circular sense of the polarization. And so this is what you input into the matrix. This is the, this light being put in. It passes through this half wave plate. And so as you rotate the theta of this half wave plate, this changes. And effectively what happens is the light is rotated through. So light coming in entirely purely vertically polarized as you rotate that half wave plate will be rotated through a variety of angles based on how you rotate that half wave plate. And so in this sense now, you can keep an object on the same part of the polarizing grid and just rotate the vectors of the light as it's passing through. Now, the problem with this kind of sensitivity is that you can't tell the difference between changes due to intensity changes. So if the object has a light curve and is getting brighter or fainter, it will also appear as a change in the signal. Or if an object has, is polarized, you would see a change in the signal as this is rotating. So what we prefer to do when we measure polarimetry of objects is after passing through this half wave plate, we want to go through some sort of beam splitter, which actually captures both components of the light, both the horizontal and the vertical component of the light, and measures them at the same time. That way, intensity changes don't bother you. And so if you can capture this sense of polarization and then rotate your light through this beam so that you're effectively swapping the beams back and forth. You're moving the positive, you know, you're moving your plus Q light first from one beam to the other and back. And you do this multiple times, you can beat down any sort of instrument systematics and get to the, you know, one part in a thousand or one part in 10,000 accuracy you need to get this high precision polarimetry that lets you sense things like what we see for the asteroids. So again, this is what we get out of the um, asteroid measurements. Uh, I'm showing here in red, this is kind of the expected behavior for these silicate rich S-type objects. Uh, and in dashed blue is the expected behavior for these primitive carbon and water rich mineral objects. Um, and so what's interesting is the objects that are primitive, these dark objects that actually reflect less light show a stronger polarization, both in this negative trough and in this increase as you go to higher phase angles. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the nice things about asteroids, and this will become important later, is that there's very little between us and the asteroid and the sun. And so unlike with stars and galaxies and other things where you have intervening material that has its own magnetic field that may induce or change polarization, the asteroid's polarizing geometry is entirely fixed by its position on the sky and the geometry of the sun, the earth, and the asteroid at the given time. So while on day to day, the expected angle of the polarization should be changing, it's entirely predictable because we know where the asteroid, the Earth, and the Sun are at any given time. And so you can calculate exactly where you expect this polarization to be. And so whenever we show asteroid polarization, what we do is we rotate the polarization into this reference frame, and we define a positive value as being perpendicular to that plane set by those three bodies, and negative being defined as polarization in that plane. Um, and so I hope that answers your question of why we have this negative to this positive exchange. So it's, it's, it has to do with the angle, right, of polarization. So it's the EVPA encoded uh, together with the percent, of the polarization fraction. Yeah. And, and because these objects are point sources that are unresolved and we can't see, and again, this applies for visible and near infrared polarization. Um, Alma polarization is something different because you can resolve the objects. But for objects we observations we can't resolve the object, we don't expect to see any polarization, but in either in that plane or perpendicular to that plane. We wouldn't, from just 
the symmetrical geometry arguments, we wouldn't expect to see anything off significantly off of those axes. Um, and so we don't, we, but while most of the papers will report what theta they measure the polarization at after they rotate it into the expected plane, um, there haven't really been any strong evidence for polarization other than either pure positive or pure negative um, that can't be explained by instrument systematics, basically. Um, so one of the things that you know we look at when we look at this polarization, the ways we can characterize these curves, we can look at how deep is this polarization, what we call the p min value. Um, and sometimes it's represented in absolute value. Um, we can ask, where does this curve cross this uh, zero line, right? Where does the polarization recover from in plane, cross zero, and then go back to what you would expect from single scattering? And what is the slope at that crossing point? Now, you'll notice that a lot of my plots will cut off around 30 degrees or so. This is because due to the geometry of where the sun, the earth, and the asteroid belt is, we rarely see objects in the main belt above 30 degree phase angle. We just can't get phase angles larger than that. This is why for things out in you know, the Oort cloud, or I'm sorry, in the trans-Neptunian population, we can effectively never get phase angles larger than a couple degrees. It's just a geometric restriction. For near-Earth objects and comets, we can get phase angles up to 90, 100, 120 degrees. And there is work being done on those objects um, at those phase angles. But for the main belt, where we have a lot of the spectral taxonomy um, from in the literature, we're kind of restricted to these phase angles. And so this is what we tend to focus on for these objects. <clears throat> and so if we look at, here I'm showing that, that slope at the crossing point uh, and the minimum polarization value uh, for a variety of objects compared to their albedo. So PV here is the albedo, the geometric albedo in the V band. And you can see that, you know, as we saw in the, those theoretical curves I showed before, that there's a good correlation between what is going on in the surface in terms of reflectivity and both that slope and that um, the depth of the polarization. And so there is a you know, one-to-one -one correspondence, meaning that if we can get polarimetry, we can infer albedo. And if we can get albedo, we can infer polarimetry. Um, but more importantly, most of the albedos we have right now, we get by measuring an object size, either with radar or with thermal infrared, taking an optical observation from a different time, converting that to what we expect the optical observation to be, and then to saying, OK, now that is what is the reflectivity we would expect. But there's not a really good way of getting an independent measurement of albedo other than from polarimetry. And so this allows us to basically put those values we're getting from the other way to the test. Um, now that we've established this correlation, we can start to look for things that deviate from that. For instance, like these red objects here that show are clearly outliers in this paper I published. Um, and this was because these albedos were way too high. And we knew that they were way too high. And this is because the literature optical measurements were incorrect. They were basically skewed to too high a value. And so that was pushing the inferred albedo to too high when you have a thermal infrared diameter. Um, so this is, you know, polarimetry acts as a very nice check on albedos from other sources. But uh, more of interest to me, at least lately, has been the mineralogical properties that we can probe. And in particular, this crossing point here. So this is the equation that describes the theory behind how you get these curves. Um, and this N here is the index of refraction of the surface material. Uh, the D here is the various scattering elements. If you assume some sort of you know, distribution of scattering events, um, and so your D min is your smallest possible scattering angle. Um, but what this means is when you basically simplify this down, the index of refraction of the surface is directly related to this crossing angle. And so if you can measure this crossing angle for a variety of objects, you can constrain the index of refraction. And that points directly to specific minerals and things we can test on Earth. And it's something we can get in no other way. We can't get that spectroscopically. We can't get that pho photometrically. This is something that really polarimetry is uniquely providing, um, is this view of what's going on on the surface. And the reason that this is so cool is, you know, there's been some weird objects found. 
And so uh, this notion of this first object called 234 Barbara um, was found by Alberto Cellino that had this crossing angle instead of being at you know 15 or 20 degrees where we saw most asteroids was out well you know basically closer to 30. And looking at that previous equation, what this implies is that this surface is covered in a mineral that has a very, very high index of refraction, not quite as high as diamond, but getting up there. Uh, and so from both spectra and from polarimetry, the, it's kind of honed in to be pointing at a specific subset of spinel. And these are a high temperature mineral that formed in the very early solar system which leads to questions about what these objects are. How would you get something that's made only of high temperature minerals? Are these some of the first minor planets that formed very early on when everything else was too hot? Are they somehow recording a surface that only gathered those materials at a later time? Or did they undergo some sort of stripping event where the outer later gathered materials were ripped off and were seen down into the surface? And so these are really fascinating bodies and we found you know, uh, about a dozen or two dozen of these kind of weird asteroids uh, that stand out polarimetrically, but are, you know, basically kind of boring otherwise, especially spectroscopically. They're just normal L types, which are kind of in between classes. Um, but, you know, as you can see here, polarimetrically, they stand out like a sore thumb. Um, <clears throat> so all of this work up until now I've been talking about with the asteroids has been done in visible light or U out to I band. Um, but as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a new instrument that just got put on Palomar, and it's called WorkPole. And so WORK is Wide Field Infrared Camera, um, and so it's designed to study JH and K uh, light. And a polarimetric add-on was added where they basically put this really clever PG, it's called. Um, so polarizing grating with a quarter wave plate in front, and it's divided in half like this with the various, you can see the optical axes illustrated here. And so what it does is when light hits it, and it's collimated going through here and then refocused. So when the light hits it, you actually get four distinct spectra. And each of the spectra represent one of the four polarization states, either Q plus, Q minus, U plus, or U minus. And so you are simultaneously getting all of the polarization states. Um, after this was installed a few years later, and just before I started my observations, a half wave plate was put in before. And this is important because it allows you to cycle the beams through these various components. And so as you rotate the halfway plate from zero degrees to 45 and through these four angles, you can see how the polarization sensed in each beam shifts. And it turned out this was really important because the optical path lengths were ever so slightly different between beams. And so trying to calibrate the polarization without this half wave plane was incredibly difficult and was wavelength dependent uh, and was you know, and time dependent, you're also getting some flexure issues. As soon as you can rotate the beams through, all of these go away. And so this is really why, you know, having these half wave plates is so important. Um, and it allows you to get really precise calibrations and then do the work and get the results I'm about to show you. And so what we did is we've started a survey. We've had uh, seven nights so far. Um, and this is from, uh, I think about six of them, uh, you know, seven objects from the first six of those nights are shown here. Here I'm showing on the left, those C complex asteroids and on the right, those S complex asteroids. And so we've pulled out the literature observations of U band out to R band. Um, and we can see that for these primitive objects where the spectra were expected to be pretty flat and pretty boring, um, our near infrared J and H observation measurements that we made with Burke pole land directly on where we expect them to for based on the optical, on the visible light behavior. And so what this is telling us is that there's really no change in this behavior as a function of wavelength. And this you know, basically extends what we saw from the B band to the R band. And there's something going on here with U, but maybe, maybe not, you know, a, a lot, U band is really tough for asteroids um, because the sunlight is just falling off and your signal gets lower quickly. Um, Conversely, with these silicate-rich objects, we see a change in this polarization. And naively, you know, you would say, okay, well, that slope kind of represents the reflectivity, and that's about the same. The depth of the polarization is also linked to reflectivity, and maybe it's indicating that these are, you know, changing in reflectivity at these wavelengths. But this shift here in this crossing point is what I find most interesting. And that's implying that 
you're getting this change in index of refraction of the material. And that's not unexpected, right? We know that a variety of materials have changes in index of refraction with wavelength. Glass does, that's why prisms work, right? That's why you can make rainbows. Um, <clears throat> but what this change is as a function of wavelength is a fingerprint for what that mineral is. And so what we really wanna do is extend this work. And instead of kind of grouping a bunch of objects that we assume are surface compositions are the same together, what we'd really like to do is go through a series of different objects. And so do a whole pure curve just for series and one just for Pallas and one just for Juno and for specific objects to really trace what that exact object mineralogy is telling us. Um, and so that's what we hope to be doing in the future. Um, but what's also cool, because those primitive objects aren't changing, we can use them as calibrators because it turns out it's really tough to find good calibration, good polar metric calibrators for these telescopes, for this instrument. A lot of the stars that we look at are things that are behind heavy dust clouds with strong magnetic fields, like in the Orion Nebula, for instance. Um, but dust opacity changes with wavelength. And the amount, and so not only can the polarization quantity change, we know that it goes down as wavelength goes up, but the angle can also change too, and in ways that you don't expect or are hard to predict. For asteroids, the angle cannot change, right? This is set by the geometry of the sun, the earth, and the asteroid. And so we can use this theta measurement from the asteroid and compare that to the predicted theta to get a pretty strong constraint on any sort of instrumental offsets that we might be having. And so one of the things we wanna do is use these polarizing asteroids, these, these primitive asteroids as standards effectively, both for theta, but also for polarization, because you can see we're able to get objects with you know, greater than 1% polarization at these wavelengths, whereas most of our polarized standard stars in the visible light have one to 2% polarization, but that drops down to half to quarter percent by the time you get out to uh, H-band. But we're getting you know, objects where we have reliable known polarizations above 1% even out to H-band. Um, and so to support this, I've put together this you know, really simple tool. I'm very excited because it's the first time I've ever done a web form. And so I'm learning you know, 1990s web programming all over again. Um, but I put together a web tool and this is just the uh, website here. And so you can go in and just type a date in and it will spit out a couple of asteroids that we've looked at um, and what the expected polarization will be and what the expected angle on the sky will be and which branch it's in just in case you're interested, as well as what the expected V or J magnitude is, um, if you ever wanna use them for polarized or unpolarized standards. And these will change day by day. Um, so you, know, you should look for the date of the observation, but the tool is there. And as I get more results showing that things are reliable calibrators, I'll add more objects in uh, to the standard set. Um, but right now, you know, that's kind of a fun tool and hopefully someone uses it. Uh, if you have any questions about it or how to use it, uh, feel free to email me. Um, caveat mTOR, of course, this is all based on you know, a handful of objects. So as we learn more, it might change, but it's looking like it's you know, a reliable calibrator at this point. So as I mentioned, my goal is to try and take these plots, like we're done with Casleo in visible light, and extend them to the J and the H band and say, if we have changes, you know, do we see the S class continuing to show this you know, increase in index of refraction? Do the L classes change? Do, do some of them have the same crossing point, but deeper behavior? Or you know, how do these objects and how do the different spectral types change from vi visible light to near infrared light? And what does that tell us about what they're made of? Um, so with that, I'll stop. I'll take questions. And uh, thank you for your attention and for staying so late. I know it's late there, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, are there any questions? Why people are thinking about questions? Let me let me start. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think I think it would be very useful to us um, if we could use your web uh, interface to access this uh, um, these asteroids as calibrators. Yep. Uh, so my question is: Do you do you also have um, do do you serve uh, 
uh, real time positions and uh, magnitudes in the in the optical. We we care mostly about the R band. Um, I I don't serve those, but JPL Horizons does, and so there's a link at the bottom that will show you how to get the real time position. That is much more particular about where you are on Earth for a lot of these asteroids. Um, so instead of trying to replicate their service, I can I'll, I can point you to how to get that information. Um, but yeah, like yeah. I said, I'm happy to work with you on this and to give you pointers for how to make Horizons work for you. Um, and conceive possibly we could even put a tool together. Uh, Horizons is a good API. And so you can just have a Python script that will do the queries for you if you want it. That would be perfect. Yes, thank you. Let, yeah. Let's, uh, yeah, we, we'll talk about this offline. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yep. Uh, so are there any, any other questions for um, Dr. Masiro? Hi, can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Joe. Sorry, I always I'm a bit puzzled with polarimetry of asteroids. Uh, yeah. Sorry for my naive question. No, no. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the talk. Um, we don't see such talks very frequently. Uh, <laughs> to explain, so they're only. So uh, I want to ask you something. Uh, do you think that, I don't know, do you, since we see that we have different regolith uh, production on the different type uh, of uh, objects, okay? So different um, uh, spectral classes between S types and C types. We saw also that between, for example, Itokawa, Benu, and Ryugu, we see different uh, coverage, different percentages, different combination of the rocks. Yeah. Um, so how does this uh, affect, so the size of the asteroid, so they have more regolith or less regolith according to the size of the asteroid, if you remember, um, and second, the, the spectral type, so the composition of the asteroid itself that leads to different um, regolith coverage. How these two different parameters you think will affect your, your plots? Yeah. Inside um, the same spectral type, so inside one yeah. curve or between the differential between the, the two curves of C or S types or whatever. So that's a really good question. Um, the, the scattering element, uh, initially I had thought that, like you said, regolith size would be what controls that scattering distance. Right. But it looks like that it's actually, that distance is some sort of property intrinsic to the minerals. And so that scattering size is actually inside of an individual mineral. And so you might expect it to change for olivine to olivine to olivine on different kinds of objects. But it's not going to change as dramatically as you would get where, you know, Vesta has fines on it and, you know, Ryugu looks like it has these large boulders. Yeah, um, because you go down to the mineral level. So it doesn't yeah. matter if it is in a pebble or if it is in a millimeter. Uh, exactly. Uh, size, uh, yeah. Grain, so it, let's say. Right. right. So it's something that goes down to kind of a quantum, you know, quantified level of, you know, this mineral when it breaks up tends to be, you know, the olivine grains are five microns in size or something. Now, what's, what's weird is if you go back to that whole explanation for the constructive and destructive interference that seems to explain everything, that D out sine alpha, right, that extra path length should care a lot about the wavelength, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're really claiming destructive interference, if you double the wavelength, then you would need to double that extra path distance to get the same constructive interference. And the fact that we're not seeing huge changes from visible to near IR, but only these subtle changes means that maybe it's more complex than that, or that something that it's, it's some sort of intrinsic, you know, it's some sort of interference thing, but maybe it's not entirely as simple as the cartoon made it out. Um, and a, a lot of it, what what I'm really interested in is trying to figure out what specifically we are looking at. When you get reflected light from an object, and especially when you get spectra or polarization from an object, right? When we're talking about 1% polarimetry, that's because it's being flooded by 99% unpolarized light. But it doesn't mean that every surface element is contributing 1% of its light to that polarized thing. It could be you have 99% blank material with 1% of the surface having 100% polarization, right? right. And so, so yeah, it's, it's 
I don't know what that answer is. I'm inclined to think it's much more in that second vein where you have a bunch of blank stuff where, for instance, the feldspar is doing nothing and you have grains or inclusions or something that are dominating the polarimetry. But that's just a guess at this point. And it's something that we really have to look into because this probably also has a handle on our spectral interpretations as well, right? We, we might be seeing, you know, the mineral bands that we see might just be, you know, a fraction of the surface absorbing 100% of the light and the other parts absorbing nothing. Or it could be, you know, homogeneously distributed on the surface scale. So right. that I don't know. And that's something I'm... I'm that would be very, very interesting because then you can start to retrieve physical uh, information for the physical properties at the least of the surface in another independent way. Right. Because um, the, the spectrum probably may not be so uh, sensitive on that because maybe we can have boulders, but on the boulders, if you even if you have some tiny amount of uh, dust, uh, this is what it really matters at the end. Uh, to compare with the lab spectra of the meteorites, maybe in the in the in the, in the lab using these uh -huh. steer machines, they can uh -huh. change them and do some polarimetry <laughs> in the lab using real meteorites, yep. commute them in, in an exposed different uh, minerals in different yeah. amounts or different um, uh, that... particle sizes or whatever, and then you can do some benchmarking maybe to help your studies. That is absolutely something I want to look at, and you know one of the things I referenced. WorkPole gives you spectra for every measurement. I have spectra for all of those things. I was just showing the broadband because you get better signal to noise. But mm -hmm. once we get this broadband sorted and understand this, now I want to start digging into what are we learning from the spectra? Because we have spectra across that band and there should be mineral behaviors across that. And do we see changes in and out of the one and two micron bands or not? Right. And that might, again, point to what specific surface elements are we looking at with spectra versus with polarimetry? Right, right. So your paper is uh, under review. It will be yes. soon out. Okay. Uh, hopefully, yeah. The, hopefully, <laughs> okay. There was, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you have done these objects that you showed, there's the big guys or you have a bigger survey? I, those, I, <laughs> Right now, my limiting magnitude is like 14 in J-band. So I'm oh, mostly stuck with the okay. big guys right now okay. um, because you have so many, you know, you're spreading the light out over the spectra. Right. Um, and so you have it, you, the things you get, you get very good SNR on, but mm -hmm. it's tough to get fainter stuff. I'm good. As the survey progresses, I'll probably push down to fainter and fainter wavelengths, but we'll get what we can get. That's so, great. Thank yeah. you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. That's very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, are there any other questions uh, for Joe? I don't see any hands. So then let's all thank uh, Dr. Masiero again uh, for this very interesting talk. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. And, uh, and we'll be in touch. Excellent. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Uh, have, a, have a good evening, good morning, depending <laughs> on where you are. Bye bye. Awesome. Thanks. Bye.